Hey, we have the best show. I'm so excited because we all want to thrive. We are sick of just surviving and trying to make it and claw our way through the day. And today, as I said, we are have this most gorgeous, gorgeous lady from the deep inside out. It's this is Connie Jerevel. Everybody loves her. This is like if, they, if this was a real audience, everybody would cheering and clapping. We're very excited to have you here today, <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for being the sh- on the show today, Mrs. Jerevel. Very, very excited to get in very in, in deep very quickly. Okay. Mm-hmm. You ready? I'm I'm gonna start with really deep because we don't know what it means to thrive and what it means to to strive. So if you could just start and give us, what do you mean thriving while striving? So um, I think that that most of us um, are not at our ideal, whether it's something inside or outside or whatever circumstances we're waiting to sort of shift. And um, very often, whether it's ourselves or our marriage or the world around us that I think we sort of think that we have this, we're on hold and um, that we're waiting for that next great thing, that next magic wand wish to happen so that we then could thrive. And I think that would be defeating the purpose of every day that we're given. um, I'm not sure I understand. You're saying that we're not where we are when we're there kind of thing. No, I, I think I'm saying that that there's no day that's not the day that we're supposed to be living. And there's no day that's incidental to who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to grow. So realizing that while we're at a place that might not be our ideal, that we could still use it in a way that is our, is ideal and thrive within whatever the day looks like, I, I think that just creates a different mindset and, and a sense of purpose. So if in our pre-show interview, you were explaining, you said that people wake up and they have their lists and they have what they're going to do and whatever. And then the day always looks completely different. Okay. We all know that. that well, yes, not all, always, but often. Yeah. 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 Often. So, so we all can relate to that. But what you're saying is that the, how we know what our mission for the day is, is because that's what God handed us for that day. Well, yeah. The, the Nasir Shalom said that says that if you ever wonder what your mission is in life, it is always the day that you woke up to. Now, I, I've said this so many times, but my father, Lo Shalom, used to, used to give us a, a sense that, you know, Avraham Babi Yamin, every day that he had was a treasure. You know, just coming to God and saying, whatever day you gave me, I just, I want to show you how I used it. I want to show you how I made that connection from the downs or the ups or wherever else I was. My, I used to tell my kids every day is like tofu. It's going to be whatever you make of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's bad because everything you make with tofu is yucky. No, joking, joking for all you vegans or whatever. I didn't say that, but anyway, okay, good. <laughs> Let's say pasta. You can put, you know, cheese sauce on it, tomato sauce. <laughs> uh, being a little. But not, I think not to, f- even I was speaking to a, a client years ago who, who just found out some really devastating news about a child she thought she knew and she found out it was a lot different. And, um, and I said, I know this is the absolute worst thing that you ever expected to have to go through with a child, but I just close your eyes and tell me just 10 years out how you're going to make this work for you in a way that, that it will be proud time and brave time. And, and as hard as it was, she came up with what she wanted to get out of it as much as it was not at all what she would have put on her, you know, may I have list. And, and she was thriving while she was striving to make sense of that really horrible time. So, um, so from a practical daily thing, you know, we wake up and life is frenzied (laughs) you know it's it's, the whole day is putting out fires and answering this and whatever there's like very little um you know luxury time uh it's usually just constant constant go i mean for most people even COVID has shifted things and whatever made worse for some people and people who are are, um uh, empty nesters you know maybe it's made it easier or maybe they're trying they've got their vaccine they can help people i mean but that wasn't true for a very long time so everybody's different we're all dealing with different stuff but usually for the most part life comes at us very fast and furiously. So how do you, you know, you had given her very good advice, which is you, 
Oh, we're having lots of things coming in from social media. We've got, I've got some questions coming in. Okay, but, but, but ladies, type in your question right now from Tor I, anytime. I, I would hope, you know, before that, I, I would hope that life doesn't always have to feel as hectic. You know, I, I think that, you know, a lot of times just things are what we, what we make them to be. And, and I think just there are ways to build in sanity and serenity in, in every part of life. Not that it could be all of life, but, you know, I, I do think it's important to sort of, you know, it's like when somebody's painting a masterpiece, you know, the most critical time that'll ensure success is when they step back and look at it and decide where they want to go with it. If you're always frantically painting, you're probably not going to have the Mona Lisa. But if you step back and you say, now, how do I want to shift that light source? Or, you know, do I want to add that color? And so if people don't take, if we don't take that time to step back and reflect and we just keep acting, um, I, I don't know that, that that's, you know, a derech that'll get us to, to where we, you know, we want to be. Gorgeous. So tell us step by step how to do what you just told us to do, because I think everybody's interested in that, but we want to know. Well, I, I think it's it's creating that time in your day. You know, I, I know that when my kids were little, if I just woke up, you know, 20 minutes or, or half an hour before they did and just had that time to really, you know, focus on my coffee. It didn't have to be anything deep, but just to have that time to just regroup and and think of, of you know, part of who I want to be today or, you know, where do I want to find that time to make the connection with that child or to think of something differently. So it's not, it's not that I might have the power to change my life, but I could change the way I see my life. And, and that's really big. I, so I had a friend. Maybe I want some practical steps on that. I've lost to read and she had so many questions for me. I'm just going to call her on my other thing while you, you continue to talk to, to the, Oh, there she came. I, I, I'm still here. I'm you with you the whole time. Trouble. I was like, where? No, 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 no. I will let you know when I'm off. I will okay. be like, you know, snapping you the whole oh, time. I was trying to call <laughs> you on the other thing. It's a dear, phone. I'm like, a oh, dear okay. friend of mine. So, okay, a dear exactly. friend of mine years ago, you know, we've gone through a lot together and she called me up and she said, I'm having a breakdown. She said, something's off. I don't feel right. And I said, look, I, you know, we've gone through everything together. If you're having a breakdown, I'm going to have a breakdown. I, it's just, it's not a good time for me. <laughs> so I said, what, what do you think shifted? You know, is everything okay? Is everybody healthy? She said, yeah. Your husband, you know, income. She says, yeah, nothing's really changed. I just, there's something going on. So I said, well, you just had a birthday. Was it like big? Was it traumatic? She says, I got it. So what? She said, honey, my husband got me an unusually absurd gift for this birthday. She said, he knows I'm always rushing in the morning and I never know what the weather's like. And these were the days before we had, you know, cell phones. She said, he bought me a shower radio so that in my five, 10 minutes in the shower, I'd be able to hear the basic news, you know, traffic and weather. So I said, wait a minute, five, 10 minutes. What did you used to do in five or 10 minutes? Should I used to think? And losing that five minute window of thinking in the shower just, just unraveled her. And, and that's all of us. So it doesn't take a lot of time to just step back and, and now we have a great word for it. In those days we didn't, but just to be mindful of where I am, just to get in touch with the fact that I am where I am right now and, and be there. If you're looking at someone just you know, let them know that you really see them. There's a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful gentleman in England. His name is Carl Honore. And uh, he was on the fast track professionally. And he had his life down to this really, you know, bit by bit science and getting a lot in. And he said one night he was putting his son to bed in record time, because that's what he did. And his son said, Dad, you're in a rush. You don't have to read to me. I'll read myself. And it killed him. And he realized that he was so busy doing everything quickly that, that he was really not living his life. And he started what became known as the slow movement, which has thousands of followers today. But the wild thing was it, it across the board to eat food that, that was cooked slower, to have meetings that, that weren't as rushed, to have conversations and just to live his life at a slower pace. And he said, you know, even if it costs me productivity, it'll be worth it. 
after three months, he realized he gained productivity because instead of being that hectic person that was chasing his tail, he was really using his time. Instead of just eating on the go, he was getting full from good stuff. Instead of just having a meeting, he was really listening to the people at the table. So he said that just slowing down, it, it's not that it costs us, it allows us to get to know ourselves and, and the rest of our lives. How do you shift that, that, that habit? Because as we're all in the habit of, you know, I, I talk a lot about how self-esteem is from productivity. Like it used to be self-esteem, you made a great cake or I don't know what, what you know, I'm going to do something sex, say something, um, uh, you know, about men and women. But so I, I don't want to go into that whole conversation, but I'm just saying we our, our, our self-esteem used to be derived in a completely different way. And now it's how much did you get done? And so you'll be pushing your kid in the swing set and meanwhile, you'll be grocery shopping. Yeah, you know, whatever. You know, there was a, a mother who was, I mean, a teacher who was telling me how the, the kids don't even know how to kind of look their mother in the eye because the mother's never looking them in the eye. Well, so it's, yeah, it's a little bit. Know, of, it's, I, I just said, maybe this is tangential, but maybe not. That years ago, I, I think it was in the Times, there was an article about um, the difference between self-esteem and self-respect. And you're hitting on something very profound, Leah, that the word esteem, just the, the meaning of the word esteem is really how you're seen by others. You know, if you want to check somebody out that you want to hire or date, like in what esteem are they held by their community? It's really a reflection of how others see you. Self-esteem is about the person's perception of how they are esteemed, which in the long run does keep people busy with the static around them, but self-respect is how you see you. Mm -hmm. And if that's your goal to give kids self-respect or to have self-respect yourself, you are gonna wanna make time to say, you know, what does that mean to me? Or, you know, how would I wanna handle that next time or, or use that? So I think it, it's not a matter of like a step-by-step, -step. It, it's about adopting the mindset of, of of what you value most and and what you want to make time for you know one, once you allow for those thoughts the feelings and the actions they just come but it's like what am I after so if I'm after how busy am I and how productive I am as opposed to how am I evolving in as a person and maybe seeing the same things and people in my life in in deeper or different or less personal ways and slower yeah. that's killer okay we've got too many um, questions we yeah, got that, okay, oh my gosh honey tons and tons of um comments and um on instagram we're getting a tons of yes 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 so true so true over and over like everything you're saying basically um the uplift magazine wrote self-judgment is about productivity we're all trying to outdo each other of how much we're doing um, and I think even more so today with social media, we feel that. Because yeah, and I, got, I only got four productive. hours sleep. Well, I only got three hours sleep. Well, yeah. I did, you know, like, yeah, it's a whole. Okay. Yeah, not, not even, they also even on, on social media, people are showing like all these amazing things that they're doing in these trips. And then they still have time to say Nishmas and Tehillim and Davin. And you're like, what? I, I barely had time to get dressed. Like, so that's where you start, start feeling really like you're I not, know. you know, yeah, yeah. very competitive. And, and, and right. And anyone who buys anything about social media probably deserves to be busy with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want, I want to interject. Wait, 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 honey, minus, minus our followers who are watching right now on social media. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the internet was that. made for Torah anytime and these kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. I go don't ahead. Mean that. I mean, I mean about, you know, buying that, that anyone's life could be about, you know, I, I think that, that we spend so much time in, in anything that's important to us, you know, trying to keep to whatever that perfect image should be. And we realize when we meet other people with that quote unquote, perfect image, we don't buy it anyway. So just spending that time being real, you know, I think if you think about the people that impress you most, it, it's the people that that are willing to admit mistakes and and where they're stuck and and relating to you in that way that's real. But I, I just wanted to interject because I think this is such a powerful piece that I learned years ago from Rabbi Kersner that that was life changing. That um, 
says in, in Devarim, in the book of Deuteronomy, we're told that man is like the tree of the field. Adam eats asadeh. And there are a lot of different ways that we compare ourselves to trees. But one of them from the Maharal is so incredibly amazing. He said that if you look back to the first directive that God gave trees, he said, I want you to do two things for me. Eight pre, I want you to be a tree of fruit. Osa pre, that produces fruit. And whatever it means, the trees, except for the esrog tree, did not obey God. They produced fruit, but they didn't become fruit. So what does that mean? That originally Hashem wanted the bark of a tree to taste like fruit. I bite into it and it's an orange tree. The bark would be an orange, plus it would make oranges. Am I making sense, Leah? Yeah, okay. Instead, instead the trees produced fruit, but they didn't become fruit. And the Maharal says, you people are just like trees. I want two things for you. I want you to produce. I want you to put out. I want you to be productive. But I also want you to become something unique inside in a way that's not just about what you're doing, but what you're becoming and being. And you're just like the trees. You're so busy producing that you're forgetting about all the inside stuff that will really make you feel and live differently. So I'll never forget, I was working with this woman in her 70s, and we were talking about this concept because she was so down about her lack of productivity because she just couldn't do as much. So I said, like, let's talk about, you know, eights pre, about who you are inside. And like, are there any, you know, things that you want to sort of look at differently? Or So she was doing amazing work. She said, honey, this isn't going well with my kids. I said, Why? She said, my daughter calls me up. She says, Ma, what'd you do today, Ma? So I said, you know, I was just looking at that tree outside and just thinking of it in, in such a new way. She says, Ma, Ma, what'd you do? Did you go to the store? Did you make anything? Did you? So she says, my daughter's ready for the straight jackets for me because I'm not doing enough. But she says, I'm doing more than I've done in years. Wow. So just realizing that and, and if you think this is so across the board, and we just came out of Purim, the, their lives didn't change. Esther was still stuck in the palace of a monster mothering his child. But the way she saw her life changed. And that's what we call Geula. So the same person within the same life, and, and that's why the Esrog tree is different. Hadar, Esrog is pre eats Hadar. It stays on the tree longer than every other fruit because it's okay staying and growing inside. And, and that could be miraculous. When someone takes their life and turns it from seeing it as a victim to realizing that they're totally supported and loved by God, they go from a nofel, a nun, to a somech, to realizing that they're supported. A nun to a samach is nice. It's a miracle. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Okay, we have to have questions. a lot of questions, but it's crazy, um, Khani, that this is today's topic and this is what you're talking about. Because literally this morning, I sat down in my journal and I wrote, the day often goes by, no matter how I try, I can't seem to get it all done. How do others do it? Am I taking on too many things? I want to complete the tasks I begin, and I feel like I have so many unfinished products. Hashem, please provide me with clarity to know what to do. And look at this. The entire oh, show is made. Leave it for me. me. Yes, wow. Chills. Chills. I, come on, okay. I want questions. I want the Yes, yes. So now the question. So someone on Facebook actually said, sometimes when things go calm and smoothly, she's waiting for that unexpected surprise, like something is going to go wrong. How do you stop feeling that way? That's great. So all feelings come from thoughts. All feelings come from thoughts. We don't realize that they do because we're so busy feeling that we don't know that they're coming from somewhere. But when you get used to that, and this does take a time, but not a lot of time and not as much time as feeling would, but let's say you bring it back to the thought. That thought is a powerful thought that when things are going well and calmly, a crisis might happen. Ladies, there's, I don't see anybody right now. I just see a black screen. Is that okay? Oh, you don't see me? Oh, now I do. Okay. Okay, good. Sorry. So, there are two types of thoughts that all of us have. One is called 
a primary thought. That's a thought that's absolute. Okay, it's 20 degrees out. I think I need a coat. That's definite. My best friend died. I, I feel lonely. That's a primary thought. But then there's a second category of thought that's called a fused thought. A fused thought is something that I fuse onto. I give it a lot of oxygen and I make it real, but it was never really that tight a thought. <laughs> I could have poked a lot of holes in it. And like what? Can the, you give an example? I'm not sure I'm following. Like an example would be what this wonderful woman shared. This is a thought that a lot of people grow up with, that if everything is going well, you could imagine how bad it's going to get. So we could grow up with a thought or hear it so often that it becomes a belief, but it's still just a thought and it's a thought that's fused. And sometimes when we know that a thought like that makes us miserable, we could sit down and just, just find holes and, and interview that thought and sort of you know let it know that, that we don't buy it anymore. One of my clients said, so cute. She says, my thoughts are like candidates. I don't have to believe everything they say. <laughs> so that's an ex that thought might have had a source in some culture or somebody else's life. But just because it's historical doesn't mean I have to let it be hysterical, right? So diffusing some of those thoughts and saying, wait a minute, you know, I think God is really capable of, of letting things be good. And, and, and if he's not, it's because that might be what I need then. But I don't have to have that anxiety of living in the past or the future. Anxiety is always because I'm not letting myself be where I am right now. It's always cycling in the past or being so worried about what could be. And you don't deserve that. So sometimes to say to that thought, I know you're trying to prepare or protect me, but you know, I think I'm okay. I think I wanna just enjoy where I am and, and we'll roll with it if, if something else comes, but I don't have to live with that, with that doom. Of, of the train wreck about to come That's now. Gorgeous, and whoever typed that in, thank you for that question, it's awesome. If it answered your question, great, let us know. And if it didn't ask other questions to clarify, let's go with one more question Then I wanna get back to some Yeah, of yeah, there's a great time. question from Sarah um, Levy on Facebook who asked, how does this translate into marriage? Meaning when marriage and marriage, how do you thrive? Good question, good question. That's great. So I think there's no one blanket you know, answer of, of how to thrive because everybody is unique in, in how they need to thrive and what thriving means to them. So I don't know if I wanna you know, make it one size fits all, but I think what could relate to all of us is that you know, when the hardest part about marriage is that you think it's not the right one for you. You know, a lot of times you think that I should have had this or I could have had that. And I was just speaking to a, a young client of mine that that's sort of transitioning into a really good place, dating someone. She's like, how do I know? You know, I don't have a guarantee. And um, and I, I, I told her something that that my father, Lovashelm, told me the day I got engaged, which is you know, going on 36 years, Baruch Hashem. So he woke me up and he said, how do you feel today? I said, Dad, I, I feel like I wish you didn't wake me up. I don't know. I feel good. I feel happy. So he said, I want to tell you something, Ken. You're not always going to feel this good. I said, why, you, why does it have to be morbid? Like, I'm okay. Like, this took a long time. He says, no, I want you to know something. He said, God gives clarity. Then he withdraws it and lets us initiate it so that it really becomes ours. It's the whole world like that right? He teaches the little baby in utero and, and then the angel taps it and then the baby relearns it. He gave us the Torah. He withdrew. We made the golden calf and then we got one that lasted longer. So right now you have this amazing clarity of this being the one, but it's not going to be forever. It's going to be withdrawn and you have to call this back and make it real. And it could happen a day from now or a month from now or 20 years from now at somebody's barbecue. And you'll say, what? What have, should have, could have? So I think in marriage, just, and, and of course, not every marriage should be kept. You know, I'm not talking about abnormal or abusive situations, but in the average marriage of ups and downs, just having both feet in and saying, this is the relationship that's supposed to work best for me. And, and I could have that confidence. And if it's a harder day, this is what we're going to be growing through together. 
and and if I have to be the one to initiate hope or vice versa, but but to know that that who we are to each other is is incomparable to who anybody else would be for us. And my my beloved teacher is Ahava Bronstein. She said, she says, why is it that on the greatest day of your life, right, when you're getting all these brachot of what living should look like, you bless this starry-eyed bride and groom, you say, Samech to Samach, you should be as happy as who? Ki Eden mikedem. You should be as happy as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So what kind of blessing is that? I'm wishing you this life where you should destroy the world and bring death and your kids will kill each other. That's no blessing. Like, why not bless me to be like Abraham and Sarah, like Jacob and Rachel? So first of all, I think, you know, it, it is a plus. They didn't have mothers-in-law. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> there you go. It's because Adam and Eve could never have said, I should have married someone else. And that's the biggest blessing in life that the life that I'm living and the people that are in it are the ones that are meant to get me to where I need to go spiritually, emotionally, and that's my self-respect. I'm going to make this work because God felt it was the best for me. And ladies, when that is at the base, I'm not making it into Lala. I'm a marriage therapist. I'm a, I, I see this day in and day out. I know how hard a marriage could be. But working it turns you into the person that you could become, even if, unfortunately, the outcome is not always what you'd love it to look like. So it's gorgeous. Uh, so let's go to the thriving, uh, uh, thriving while striving. So striving that what you meant by that in that title is you meant the daily grind of trying to be successful at whatever it is that we're being, you know, we're trying to get to. And, but at the same, so maybe explain that a little. Go Because by the end of the show, I want everybody who's watching to have a tool for, um, uh, you know, while they're striving, to have this tool of how to thrive. I think that is, you know, so needed in this day and age. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, it's, it's, thriving is both something you do with actions with your hands and it's also something you do with your your neshama with your soul it's something that you do with your emotions so let, let's let's go to how to how does one thrive it, so is I, that a place think, you are or is it something you do i think thriving to me is is just feeling that that you're growing in a way that that feels better so and and it means that you're dealing with the situation in a way that doesn't deplete you even if it's a hard one <laughs> so well, good luck I with that, that <laughs> right. no right. I, I think maybe just you know the goal did i find a window of time for myself that you know i i did something that um that felt good or it felt like i was in control of or that i wanted for myself today or did i take time today to just allow myself one new thought of um, something or someone in my life that felt better or um, more connected than, I, than it was before. I'll give you an example. So I, I keep coming back to this theme that thoughts create feelings, feelings create actions, which is really you know, so much of, of so much of our musar and, and, and cognitive stuff. So the way that you feel towards someone else is based on your thoughts. Now, how do you know those thoughts are accurate if they're about another human being, right? Mm -hmm. We never really know that our thoughts are accurate, but we have so many assumptions about the people in our lives, especially in marriage, that we hold on to and create feelings that we act on. So right now, Leah, if I think that I recognize your picture from the post office and you are that escaped murderer, I'm going to feel forbid. pretty <laughs> uncomfortable, right? right? But if I think that you're a lovely person, I'm going to feel happy to be with you and I'm going to act accordingly. So it's my thought that'll generate the feelings that create my actions. So the first step in marriage is to allow yourself curiosity. You could be living with someone for decades and really not know who they are in terms of them if you haven't been curious. 
know, when, when a client tells me, like, I don't need to be curious, like, I know him. He's like, even Hashem knows everything. What was his first interaction with Adam and Chava? Ayeka, where are you? I want to be curious. The Malvin says, She'elat Madrega, I'm asking you where you're at. I want to hear it from you. He's modeling relationship for us. So just taking the time to say, okay, I know the thoughts that I have about this man that I'm living with, and I know how they feel, but I want to sort of step away from them. I know how that outfit looks. I, I want like to be stepping open. back from the painting, like you were saying before. Just yeah. Like I didn't gorgeous. think of that. That's exactly it. So if, yeah. if your thoughts are like a wardrobe, like I, I don't want to wear that sweatshirt from high school anymore. So like, let's see. So just being curious, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I grew up in a family where everybody interrupted each other and it was a sign of love. Like, oh yeah, I know what you're going to do. And, and my husband's family, like interruptions were very, very inappropriate. Now I'm married a long time, but, and I try hard not to interrupt. But sometimes it just, you know, and one day after so many years, it was the first time I realized as much as I know what he might want, I don't really understand it from his side. So I asked him, can I ask you a question? What does interruption feel like to you? And he just, and he gave me an answer that I never would have thought of. And I said, that's that's an awful feeling. I said, I know. I said, you know, it's going to be a lot easier for me not to interrupt because I never knew that it meant that. If I felt that way, I would never want to be interrupted. So the question is why it took me over three and a half decades to ask the question. <laughs> <That's my own laughs> it's another but, thing. Okay. <laughs> but, but just being curious with someone who I do know but I never knew you could be living with someone and experiencing the same thing, but it'll never mean the same thing to both of you. So being married doesn't mean that you become the same person. It means that, that I learned to respect your difference and know them. I want to know who you are. I just had a couple, they've been married also uh, three decades or whatever. And she bought these, these, um, uh, 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 blankets for her couches or whatever and her husband didn't like them and they were having this big battle over the blankets and and you know that they I guess these throw things that she was putting over over her thing and what she find you know what she finally did is she explained to him you know for for him the, it's like he likes the blankets or he doesn't like the blankets whereas for her it was it's part of her identity it's part of how she expresses herself it's what how other people perceive her when they walk in her house and it has this many many myriads of level uh, levels of meaning not just because she's a woman and man maybe that's more common in women maybe not i don't know that it's irrelevant but for her feelings it was it's it's yeah you know, she had chosen them with great care and love or whatever and it almost felt like a rejection of her so it was a total until there's that communication until there's that closeness of reaching out and trying to understand where the other person's coming from, you, you just have this. this and, and I would reiterate, so until there's that curiosity, that, that the more we adopt an unknowing, unassuming way, and, and I don't have to get it, I just have to be open to you educating me, because you're the expert of yourself. So, so much of, once I'm in, the first step is that I'm in, this is my person. You mean you, if the first thing is to commit? Oh, both feed into this relationship, not not the tossing them away and saying, "Oh, I should have married the you know somebody else." Right, right, and not always thinking there might be or you know I could have. And, but after you feel that you're in, so if this is the person that's bashert to me, that that I'm going to gain my sense of shleimut of completion from learning them, and and that really opens up a whole new thought that creates new feelings. So, you know, I, I had a couple I was working with that were going through an incredibly difficult time with, with an unwell child. I mean, a, a really this, this child was, was, was not, not, you know, it wasn't clear that the child would live and, and they were really in an awfully difficult place. So they were talking about, you know, how the community was not, you know, living up to their expectations. And they were both nodding. And I said, could you both tell me what that means? So it was wild. He, the wife said that 
I go to show and, and no one's coming over to ask me how I'm doing. The husband said, I go to show and everyone's coming over to ask me how I'm doing. And they looked at each other and they said, each of them said, I didn't know that you'd prefer A or B. And it was just this light moment of them realizing like, wow, like I didn't realize that it was so different for you. You know, that what you need is, is privacy. What I need is connection. And just learning that one fact was such an aha moment. It's not a big deal, but it is a big deal. It's also the so, opposite. It's mind boggling that, right. that they were complaining about the same thing, but they were, they, yeah, very, very. And, and, and that they each gained a sensitivity. Like the wife was able to say like, do you want me to give you more of your own space? And he said, and, and do you want me to be at? And it was so beautiful how just realizing that, that the curiosity was something that would feed them was, was, was just, it was just gorgeous. Okay, we have more questions coming in. This is the, this, it's about connecting and communicating. It's, it's gorgeous. Okay, come with the question. Well, actually, somebody on Facebook is saying crying. This is so true. So it's like you're really hitting home yeah. with this information. Um, and someone is asking on Instagram, which it, we happen to have, Hani, a lot of um, singles and a lot of divorcees that watch our show. A lot of divorcees, actually. Um, sadly, more, more today. And they're saying, can you give advice for for people that are waiting to find their, like, to find their next, you know, to find their husband, they just feel like they can't relax. They want to relax, but they feel like they're just not thriving. What do you mean relax? What do you mean Meaning relax? they're striving towards getting married, but they feel they're I, not thriving in it because they're just so, it's on not- On hold happening. until they yeah. find the guy. Exactly. That's okay, fine. Good. Great questions. Thank you. It's a great question and, and it's very real pain. So I, I think that one of the most beautiful quotes I saw was in the O.L. Rachel that says that, that if a woman is not married, she should never buy the thought that she cannot be fulfilling her tafkid, her mission, because every single day of your life is your mission. I, I want to just publicly say this, and it's such a, such a nerve. It, it hits such a nerve for me. Shame on us as a community that we are not giving our single women more leadership positions and more credit for building our communities in the ways that, that they're so capable of. And I, I am so, it's really something that angers me. Now, Sarah Schneerer started the movement of girls schools when she was divorced with no children. And she wouldn't be able to get a job as a principal in a lot of communities today. So shame on us ooh, ooh. that we're connecting anyone's worth and the rest of their mission to their marriage status. And I think we really need to look at that as a community and, and just, just as Jews worldwide. It, it's no, a wedding band should not give someone the permission slip to be productive. So it's awful. Okay, off my soapbox. Okay, wow. Okay. Um, but in terms of your question, I think that, that being stuck, feeling stuck is, is the worst form of gullus. It's the worst form of exile. And I think that, again, it's about the thoughts that I could sort of, there's a, a very beautiful approach now in psychology that's becoming very, very popular. It's called ACT. It's called acceptance commitment therapy. And the philosophy is, is so beautiful and so in sync with the Torah that when you're going through any hard time, it doesn't mean that that hard time has to define you. It doesn't mean that you're frozen into that place before you could move to the next stuff that life brings. So of course, in one way of being married, I might not have control. But what if I did this? What if I said, I want to be real and accept what's really lousy right now in my life. I want to be real about the prospects that I feel I'm having, about the way I, I might be treated or, or that lousy date or whatever else. I, I want to be real. I want to eat a full meal of that so I don't have to keep on snacking about it when it leaks into my day because I didn't think about it when I needed to. That's, I'm, I'm accepting it. Once I make create that space, to really accept it and be real and, and let Hashem into that. Tell Hashem what hurts and what you're angry about. Be real. You don't have to be polite when it comes to connecting to Hashem. 
you know, look through Tehillim. David Amelech is all over the place. You, why am I angry? Why did you leave me? How long is this going to last? You know, I'm crying at night. Be real. So give give that over in a way that that's that's authentic. Once you do that, now say, okay, I have that compartment, and I could always add to it if more stuff comes up. But now that that's there, what do I want to commit to that is in my control, that nothing has to stop me from? So I have a, a brilliant, brilliant, phenomenal single friend that, that was in her 40s, and, and, and she realized that she really wanted to host Shabbosin. And she said, I should. And she bought this magnificent dining room table for her apartment in the city. And she started having these amazing Shabbos meals and, and hosting families and whoever else needed. But she realized that she deserved to be a hostess. She didn't have to be married because that was what she wanted to commit to do. So as, as soon as we have permission to accept and we do that fully, we can equally give ourselves permission to commit and do that fully also. So What's you move. Tea? What was the T? The commit therapy. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. So, so just realizing that as much as I am stuck and I'm being real and I want Hashem's attention to sort of be with me in there, I'm not stuck everywhere. And that becomes our self-respect. So I think that that's really an inspiring way of living. You know, I, I was working with this wonderful divorcee, a, a wonderful guy, and, and, and his wife left him. It was very abrupt, and, and he just was feeling so loserish in so many ways. And he said, I have nothing left to give. I have nothing left to give. And I said, that's so painful because you, you're just such a giver. And he said, I know. But he, she just made me question being wanted. And, um, and after a couple of weeks, I said, like, is there anyone that you'd feel confident enough to give to. And he said, you know, there's this one guy that's, that probably has it harder than I do. And, and I, I think I'd, I'd feel good enough to, to reach out and, and call him once a week and check in. And, and I think I could even take a walk around the lake with one friend, maybe once every couple of weeks. I, I could do that. And slowly, you know, those commitments mm. built until the point that he remembered that, that he was a giver. So just having that room for the, you know, what I still could do. As mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Okay. We've got more questions coming in. We have Tora, anytime questions? Yeah. So basically everyone is, again, just blown away. Pure brilliance and well put is really the best way to describe <laughs> everything that's being said. Just reading the comments. Um, yeah. So, so, so in, in that, when you're saying, so what about someone who's having, they want to know someone's asking if they're having a um, sort of difficulty in their relationship with their husband, um, how do they, do they just box that and then try to commit to something? What, is, what practical steps can they take right now to say, I can, I can be upset with my husband or I can be dealing with this, but I can still move forward and thrive in my relationship. So, right. That's, that's, that's such, it's beautiful to just even think of that question. So, um, I don't see, Leah, you're still there? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see me now? So, yeah, oh, no, I wonder I if it, if it clicks off, if I'm talking, you're talking, I don't know. Oh, no, that's good. Okay. So as sad as this sounds, it's also empowering that in every marriage, it's always ideal if both parties want to do the work to make it better, but one person could always change a marriage. One partner could always change a marriage. And I, I think that's, that's really, really important to, to hold on to. I, um, years ago, there was this phenomenal woman that came to do some work and she said, I know that I could say it's his fault and it, probably a lot of it is, but he refuses to come and I deserve a better marriage. So I told him, I'm just coming and doing the work. And it was a few months later and she was doing a fabulous job and she called me up she said honey I am a class act I said I know but like what happened she said my husband woke up this morning he said you know things have really been going good and um it's about time you did that work and she had every reason to kill him he said I took a breath and I said you know 
either one of us could have done this work. And I'm just so glad that I was the one that did it. And believe it or not, a month later, he started coming to me to do his own work <laughs> for something totally unrelated. But she's right. So when you are stuck, yes, it's always important to be real and accept and have that time and to give yourself that compassion. But when you commit, know that that commitment could also shift the marriage, even if it's just about changing you. So I think that that's one piece. The second piece is if God forbid someone's in a marriage where their husband is just beyond um, stuck and they really do have to sort of create a life in spite of him, then, um, then, then that might be what they need to do. You know, I, I obviously, you know, they, they should get some advice about the feasibility of that or, or the worth of it. But, but if that is where you are, then you've got to make the rest of your life work. Now, there, there's a, a cute thing that, that always helps just in terms of a visual. If you take your pointer and stick it right in front of your nose, like right in front of your nose and look at it, mm -hmm. how big does that finger look if that's what you're staring at right now? Ginormous, huge. <laughs> it looks huge. If you leave your finger right there and turn over your right shoulder, as right far as you can go, <laughs> okay. how big is your finger now? You can't really see it. Right. So that's what we call shrinking the monster. That sometimes something's looming as the biggest part of your life, but you could choose to look elsewhere. So maybe right now your marriage is consuming you, but there could be other parts of your life if that has to be your choice, if it's sad, but it has to be your choice. That if you build those other parts of life, the marriage is there, but it won't be the everything. And at certain stages and in certain circumstances, that might be what has to be, you know, and, and, and the thriving could Can still happen. Can I just happen. ask you a question about that? Because, you know, um, the, from our Masora, you know, Rav Moshe Cordovero says all blessing comes from the husband, uh, from the Hashem through the husband into the wife. And, you know, if standing on one foot, if you had to know, what, and actually, uh, you know, I've got marriage secrets. It's got two, it's, uh, I wrote this book, but it's, I can push it all I want because all the proceeds go to Shalom Bias. I don't make any money from it, but there's 220 sources in there. And uh, uh, what happens is that if you had to stand on one foot and say, what is our Masora? It's becoming a receiver. And that the husband's the giver. The, this is a Gemara. This isn't a, 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 the husband's the giver. The wife is the receiver. And like you said, you know, because I've had uh, people who've come on the show and said that you need it takes two, and the man needs to do this and whatever. And it's true, well, maybe. Whatever. It, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I couldn't be with you more. That okay, is good. optimal. But there, are sometimes in some men's lives, that whether it's physically or emotionally, or they're not able to give, whether they're incapacitated in one way or another. But, and that's why I said it has to be that you realize that this is, you know, what is. But in those sad instances, or even if someone is, you know, struggling through something and he's got to be doing that work alone, whether it's an addiction or a depression, or the wife does still have to thrive. Mm -hmm. And he's not yeah. in the position at those times of giving anyone anything. He's just got to build himself. It's true. Well, let me ask you this. And sorry, I'm not trying to be argumentative, or whatever. I just want to nail this down so that people who might be dealing with these things, so I deal with people with husbands with mental illness or addictions and things like that. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the, it's really crucial to be able to, you know, I, I send them to people like you who can walk them through and help them. You know, I'm not, I, I'm not a clinical therapist. Uh, uh, but however, from our Masora, we, my understanding of it, and I checked this with, with the, uh, uh, Usher Weiss, uh, and, and, and actually many Rebeim, because I get nailed on this all the time, is that if the husband is completely incapacitated and the woman is working three jobs and she's taking care of seven children and she's, you know, she's cooking all the food and buying all the groceries and she's doing everything, you're telling me he's sitting on the couch doing nothing, that all the bracha from the house is still because of him? Like, really, <laughs> really? And I, I'm not familiar with this. I don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. So hold on, but I'll just explain because this is a way that people can understand it so that it, it's a deep spiritual thing. Anyway, the answer I got for that is yes. Okay. Very hard to hear, 
you're hearing it, if this is your first time watching the show, you're like, what? But here's the gorgeous thing about this is that you, who a woman who feels like her husband is, you know, uh, no, uh, no good Nick, right? She feels like, a, like um, uh, uh, she feels completely like a victim and like she has no power in the situation. And here's where your power lies. The power lies in understanding Okay, if that's the case, if he's responsible for all the blessing in my life, even though he's doing nothing and I'm working three jobs, if he's, and ble by blessing, I mean everything, all the money in the house, all of the worldly goods, all of the, um, you know, physical goods, all of this spirituality in the home, if he, if it all comes through the husband, and maybe it's on your merit as well, the rabbi said that, but if that is the case, it gives you a lot of power to do one very crucial thing which is to go from being resentful to going to being grateful and appreciative of, well, I don't know, how, this is this crazy spiritual thing that our Masora, our 3000 year old bulletproof track record of success. This is one thing that they, that, that it says it's very hard for me to macabre, but to, to accept, but that allows you to be empowered. Now, when you start to show gratitude, guess what? The husband shifts his whole in, inner reality shifts you yourself become a better able to cope with the things so i very much want your input on this but but this is the masora as it you know uh, this isn't like leah richheimer's great idea or crazy idea but there's a whole shift that happens in a woman and i've watched this for the last couple of decades where a woman's like oh if he's the source of blessing instead of being having this deep rage and anger of where he's coming from. This is the cards God himself handled me, handed me. What am I, who am I going to be? Who, how am I going to step? How am I going to thrive? You know, how am I going to thrive in this? If that is the case, if they're dealing with all of that. And it just, it gives women, instead of feeling like a victim, they, they end up feeling like they, they've got some control over their life. So I'd be very curious to see how, um, it, from, from your perspective, from the therapist's perspective, how a woman, um, uh, you know, can, what are practical things that maybe um, she can do to, to take this on to free her of that, that feeling of victimhood. I'm sure a lot of people come to you feeling like victim and almost wanting to be feeling like victims. And the last thing before I turn it over to you is there is a whole, you know, people say, oh, the husband, you know, people like the first time they listen to the Armistura, they're like, okay, Leah, when's the, when's the men's class, you know? And when's the men's class, right? So the reason they say that is because they don't realize a woman's power. They don't realize how a woman can just by subtly changing little subtle things and very, very clear what she can do, what to, how she can build him up, how she can create her husband to be the guy she always wanted to look, look up to. That a woman just by being becoming more of a receiver and, and receiving the, the husband himself changed. And it... Uh, and I'm not talking about giving, he doesn't need to give, like he doesn't need to bring flowers, it, although that's good and maybe he'll eventually I think, do. I think I got it. We only have a few more minutes. I, okay. I do want to talk about the book. So um, I think two things, I, I'm not familiar enough with the sources that you're referring to. So I would have to really, you know, do some work and, and do some thinking. But the two things that I would say, um, even if someone can't come to the level that, that you're suggesting is that that every new thought could create new feelings. So the thought of seeing someone as a blessing or accepting someone will obviously create new feelings and new actions. Um, that's one thing that I think is, is just a given, however somebody takes it. The second thing that I'd say is that um, I think in life, people really need to feel needed. You know, they've done studies with elderly and people that that have a pet you know will will do better emotionally than people that live alone because they have something that needs them so in a marriage usually there's one spouse that is performing more whether it's the man or the woman and it's important for that performing spouse to find some areas where the other is needed even if it's just asking their advice or their input on something or making them feel that they're expert in some way, that I, I think that's just, you know, a, a wonderful way of, of finding bracha love in a relationship. Yeah, love it. So, you know, even when you're, you know, at times when a husband's out of work, 
but just to say, look, you know, this is what goes on in work today. I'd love to know how you would have handled it. You know, or like, I think I need your take on, on what's going on with our child. So I, I think even when someone's at a low, you know, that might shift our feeling of, of needing them. But I am very excited. And I do want to talk about the book. For the yes, last good. Time. Okay. So that's the, now how can, how can people get in touch with you and where could they buy your book? And okay. tell us about the book. So um, give us what's the title. Year, the title of the book is. I, I just came out, thank God, with a book through Feldheim. It's called Safira in Our Lives transforming our relationships with ourselves, others, and Hashem. And um, the way it came about was last year when all of us were sort of trapped with COVID, a group of 25 women approached me if I would start a WhatsApp little um, five minute, up three to five minute class a day on relationships, because we were all stuck with all these relationships in our life in the house. So um, for Sphira. And it turned into a group of, of 2,500 women, Bar Hashem. You're welcome to join. You could email me and we'll put you on the list. It's free. Now we do tefillah. Now we're going to be starting Sphere again. So um, a lot of the women said, you know, can you put this into a book? And, and, and Bar Hashem, I did this with my daughter, who's a wonderful writer, and she lives in Toronto. And um, we added a lot of stories and, and professional sort of pieces from therapy. And uh, this book just came out. It's now available for order on Feldheim. You could go to the Feldheim website. I think you have the link I gave you, Leah, yeah, under forthcoming books, and you could order it. And it will be in the stores over over Pesach or right after Pesach, Mir Tashem. And I'm just excited because, first of all, my father just passed away, and um, this book is in his honor, mm -hmm. and he changed my life and my relationships. And so that's one thing. And, and the second thing is just to know that there's 49 steps that Hashem gives us, that he tells us these are the steps toward having relationships in, in the most fulfilling ways. And I can't think of a more productive relationship manual. So just using the days of Sphira and hopefully beyond, um, I'm very, very grateful that, that, you know, that this book will be something I could share with people. That's so I hope. Thank I you hope very much. And you said, how can they email you so they could email you oh, to get on your WhatsApp group? My email is um, not that original. Chani Jurabel, C-H-A-N-I-J-U-R-A-V, like in Victor, E-L, at gmail.com. And I welcome your comments and criticisms and anything I could grow from. So uh, I, I have to say, this is my first talk show. <laughs> and I, it's a lot of fun. So. <laughs> thank you, Leah, for your energy and enthusiasm. And Leah, can she name. give the name of the book again? People are asking for the oh, name. What's the yeah. name of the book again? It's called Sephira in Our Lives. From S-E-F, -E S -E like in Frank, S-E-F-I-R-A-H in Our Lives. And it's put out by Feldheim. Okay, yeah, we have a lot more questions, but we're not going to have time for it. Well, uh, I guess maybe we'll shoot them another time. Uh, thank you so much. You, the, the, de the depth of what you gave over and the practical advice, and we're all going to start thriving starting now. Thank you very much, Ms. Durville, for being on the show. This is Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show. We'll see you next time.